it is shock wheel time. I know I've been talking about this forever, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and try to get this landing gear set up on the plane this week. And uh, before I do, I wanna give a quick explanation of why I'm doing this. So um, when I had my Kitfox 5, I had the Grove gear on there and it was a great all around airplane. The more I played around with it, the more I changed it, the, the more specific it became and the less all around good airplane it was. By putting the, the shock monster landing gear on it, it was great for landing off airport. Um, but it lost so much airspeed, about 10 to 12 miles per hour in cruise, that it just shrank its capability as far as the, its speed envelope. It didn't gain anything or lose anything on the bottom end, so your stall speed stayed the same. You just limited how fast you could go. Um, it did have its advantages in landing in rough areas, um, not bouncing, allowing you break and land a little bit shorter. Um, but if you were good at landing with the Grove gear, there wasn't a whole lot of places I've gone that I, with the Shock Monster that I wouldn't have gone with the Grove and a good set of Alaska bush wheels on it. Um, I know that's kind of counter to what everyone else is saying about the Shock Monster, and don't get me wrong, I love the Shock Monster landing gear. You can land, you know, you don't have to do a good landing. You can really put it on and plan it where you need to and not worry about damaging the aircraft. It makes it um, safer to fly. Um, it, it hides a, f a bad landing really well. Um, and it does allow you to brake more efficiently because you're not bouncing. So it has its definite advantages, but the speed penalty really shrinks the capability of the airplane. If you're looking at an all around airplane, if you're just building it specifically to take off from your home airport, fly 10 minutes and go play around like we do a lot, um, then there's no reason to change anything. Um, but if you like to take your airplane on trips and you know 110 is an acceptable cross country speed for you, then the Grove landing gear is really the better choice for an all around airplane. You can still land off airport, but it cruises better and it just, it, it, it flies better too without all that drag underneath. Um, you tend to, I don't know, this is just my experience, but especially with my Model 5, it just felt like I'm holding the nose up all the time with that uh, big shock monster draggy gear on it. And with the Grove gear, I could get more up on the plane, meaning more up on the step and uh, just a better angle in the, in the air because you don't have as much drag. Um, so that kind of left me wanting to at least have both options. But shock, uh, Behringer came out with a shock wheel system. And they've had it for quite a while. They've been flying these on some airplanes in the UK and with great success. So um, I'm interested in testing it out. It's not gonna be a full on, um, you know, very specific landing gear like the shock monster landing gear is. But it may provide enough dampening that if you don't do a good landing with the Grove gear, instead of it springing and bouncing and then taking the weight on and off the tires as you try to brake and get stopped, if it takes that initial hit, dampens it, and if you hit real hard, you flatten that out and then use the Grove spring, um, there should be plenty of travel there. But if it takes that initial hit and it dampens it so that you don't bounce, then it's going to accomplish what I want it to accomplish. And you don't have this big cabane shock section in the middle of your plane that's creating all that drag. It's like pushing a dozer through the air. So all this will be clean in between. This is the gear here upside down on my workbench. Um, but I'm removing all this drag that would be in here. So you got your, your, uh, your cabane V and then your shock. So you got this big X right in the middle of the airplane that's creating all this drag. So that is my thought process behind it. Um, the disadvantages, I am gonna add weight because just the straight up Grove gear without the shock wheel is about the same weight as the shock monster setup. It's actually about a pound and a half heavier when I compared the two um, when I did it on my Kit Fox 5. So we're gonna take and add the weight of the shock assembly on either side and I can't remember exactly what that weighs. I'll look it up and I'll try to post it here, but you are gonna add weight. But you know, if I can get a half or a mile per hour per pound I'm adding, I am totally fine with that. So um, I'd be happy to add some weight to it to get speed. All right guys, I'm getting started on this shock wheel installation and wanted to show you a little bit uh, what it looks like before it goes on the airplane. So 
uh, on the bench right now. We've got the Grove gear. It's upside down. And the shock wheel system consists of the shock, an axle, and a brake system that would mount up to your, basically to your Grove gear. So where this axle mounts right here is the same as if it was to be mounted right here. Um, there is a spacer involved there, but the four hole pattern on this axle would mount right to the, uh, the Grove gear itself. So the shock wheel just goes in between those. So if you already have the Behringer brake system, you can just take the axle off your Grove landing gear or your uh, Kit Fox shock monster gear legs and that will mount to the shock wheel system itself. Um, if you don't have any of the Behringer stuff, then you'll need the wheel and brake kit and the shock wheel. And then it, the shock wheel itself just mounts into the four bolt pattern on the Grove gear. Um, the thing that took so long is I was waiting for this spacer that goes in here. And the spacer allows you to put the bush wheels on without the tires touching the shock itself. So right now they're all mounted up on both sides to uh, the Grove landing gear. So I'm going to get ready to go put this on. And to do that, I want to make sure I have all the parts. So these boxes down here are full of parts. And so what I did is I got the landing gear bracket kit from Kit Fox, powder coated the outside of them. Um, so that's what that box is, and some bolts. Um, I also got two longer bolts um, so that I can put my exhaust bracket also hanging below those uh, gear brackets. Um, here's what those spacers look like. I got an extra set in the shipment. So that just goes in between the axle and the shock wheel. Um, this is the old landing gear bracket style um, from like a Kip Fox 5. And this is not what we, uh, we're going to use anymore. They went to a, a different style on the 7s. Um, the only problem I'm having is I had the gear legs uh, or the Grove gear powder coated and so the thickness of the powder coat is preventing these brackets from sliding over. So what I have to do is determine exactly where they're going to be positioned, mark it, and then I just need to, to sand off the powder coating on either side of the Grove gear so that those will drop into place. So that'll be need to be done and I really can't do that until I have them positioned um, under the airplane so I know right about where, where that bracket's going to sit. Uh, so in order to do this, I need to, I've got the back jacked up so the airplane's level. I'll just make it easier to set the gear on there when it's level. So I need to bring my hoist around and lift the uh, front of the plane. Now I've seen some of you guys lift planes kind of improperly. You don't want to ever lift from the engine or the gearbox. That's definitely not engineered for that. You're talking about basically a thousand pound airplane. In our case, we're about 830 pounds. Got some fuel in it, so we, I mean, we could be at 1,000 pounds. You don't want to put that stress on anywhere on the engine, but you can do it off of the engine mount. So what we'll do is we'll come down to this point here and on the other side, make sure I'm not lifting up into the cowling. So I got to find some, some way to attach to the engine mount itself. And I'm not really going to lift it as much as just relieve the weight from the gear. And then I'll unbolt this gear where it gets messy is the brake system. So the brake system has to be uh, disconnected and all the fluid will come out then. And then once I disconnect the four attachment points, I'll leave the whole cabane and everything together and I'll just wheel it out. And then hopefully wheel the other one back in with the other tires on it. So I know it's not gonna go that easy. All right, so that's going to be the fastest configuration. <laughs> Retractable gear kit box. Um, so this is super sketchy. I've got a support under it, but it's still hanging off of the engine hoist. The problem with doing this is you're left to right. There's no support, so uh, one wing can drop. That's why I have the sawhorse under there. And those rear brackets I'm going to leave in place. Um, so the gear's off. I'm going to go ahead and get the shock wheel. 
uh, with the tires on it and see if I can get it lined up over there and uh, see about sanding off the powder coat. So I would like to get the weight on it before I finish for the day. I guess I ran into a little snag here. Um, the roll pins are in the wrong position. So this gears off of a Kitfox Model 5 and these pins are too far out which positions the gear on one side too far in and in the wrong place on the other side. So these pins have to come out and go to these outer holes and they're pressed in. I can't get them out. So that's what I'm working on. You can see what it looks like though. A lot less drag underneath. It's pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, I had to move the roll pins. Um, got that taken care of. It is on its on the gear now. The weight is on the gear. So it compressed the struts down. So I got to check and see what the air pressure is in the shock wheel because they're pretty flat. Um, and then I have to check how it's going to sit when I'm done because this prop is really long and it's really designed to have the shock monster landing gear. Um, it's got plenty of clearance when it's tail low, but this is like probably as far pitched forward as you would do on takeoff. And it gives me about seven inches with the shocks fully compressed. Um, so this might be a little bit of a long propeller for this setup, so we got to be careful with it. Um, yeah, looks pretty cool. Um, it did compress about two inches, so there definitely needs some more air in the shock. You know, raise it up. Probably run it pretty stiff to start with, just to see, you know, clearance-wise and everything. Um, but man, look how clean it is underneath now. The next step is to route the uh, brake lines. You know, bring them forward and then down the gear leg. They're not long enough now to make it, so I'll have to do a, a junction somewhere. All right guys, so I know you've been waiting a long time for this update. I've uh, got the shock wheel on the kit fox. So let's go ahead and take a walk around and show you what it looks like. We take your standard stock Grove spring gear, mount up the shock wheel on there. We've got some spacers that are used for the bigger tires. So that's basically so the tire doesn't contact the shock. That's about three inches of height when the shocks are inflated. Um, playing around with the pressure right now, I haven't run it at all, so right now I'm 150 pounds in the shocks. There's this little bicycle pump, pumps them up and down. So I'll be playing around with that to find the right setting for a good ride. Uh, I also redid the muffler mount. This came out pretty slick. Nice and steady, sturdy in here now. And uh, I flipped on its sides, so it's a little more streamlined. So you can really see the difference now of the drag that was underneath the plane that's now gone. So I expect, I don't know, somewhere around 10 miles per hour increase. So I'm going to go break in the brakes real quick, do a taxi, taxi test on that, and then uh, we'll go fly it, put the cowling back on. I also change the oil and all the gearbox fluid, so I'm going to leave it off for those taxi runs so I can check for leaks. And then... Uh, We'll get it to uh, back together the cowlings on and go fly. Um, so, so far all I've done is pavement landing. So it's really wet everywhere because we've had a lot of rain, which is great. Um, but not great for off airport stuff. So we'll probably go down to the river, try to find somewhere in the river where I can test, test these a little bit. I do have cameras set up today to point right at the, the uh, gear. And I'll we'll just kind of see how it works. All right guys, as I head out here to test out the shock wheel, I want to talk through some of the stuff that we're going to see uh, throughout the testing. Originally I started off with about 150 PSI. And then I think on this flight, I had backed it off down to about uh, 120 uh, throughout the testing even went down to 105 then to 95 and ended up at 85 so as we start the testing here what I'm looking for is to see what the shock is doing as far as its articulation um, on the landings 
Now the shock wheel has to work kind of in harmony with the spring rate of the Grove spring gear. So as you see on this first one coming in here, the picture of the left wheel, watch the struts and the movement of the strut on touchdown. There wasn't a lot of movement there. So that's when I had too much uh, pressure in the shock. So the next couple clips were similar. I had the same rate in there. You can see it's a little bit compressed as I go to take off and then it extends out real well. But on the impact, uh, initial impact on landing is when I wasn't seeing very good um, articulation up and down from the shock with this much PSI in it. So let's watch these landings and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, so this is a different day of testing and I've switched the tires out now to test the system with the 29 inch Airstreak um, Alaska Bush wheel. And so it's a little bit softer with this tire versus the 27 and a half inch Desert. But what I've really changed that's made a big difference on these landings is I've moved to 85 PSI in the shock. So as we come in here to land, watch the articulation on the shock on this one. You'll see the initial hit is going to provide a lot more upward movement in the shock, dampening that impact. Alright, so you guys can see that lowering that PSI down to 85 has really made a big difference in the performance of the shock wheel. And I'd like to note that this is actually where they recommended I start was at 85 PSI. Um, it does compress it down when it's sitting on its own weight, um, but the action that you're getting out of the shock wheel is, is much, much better and doing what it's supposed to do, and that's uh, absorbing that initial impact and reducing the tendency for it to bounce. So I'll let you guys watch as I do a, quite a few more landings here with this setup, and you can see uh, you know, how they perform. You do get a small bounce. And I just want to point out that I'm not landing this softly. I'm dropping it from about two or three feet just by cutting the power and, and sometimes dropping the flap to put the weight on the wheel to see how they're going to perform. So I'm not trying to do a nice smooth wheel landing. These are, are pretty good, good hits as far as um, the rate of descent on landing to get that bounce. On a normal smooth landing, there wasn't any bounce at all. So the design of the shock wheel is really meant to take up the initial impact and absorb that first contact and the next couple bumps. So the larger impact is absorbed by the shock wheel and then as you slow down and you get into the rough, like in this case the rocks that you're rolling across, those higher frequency impacts are going to be absorbed um, by the Grove spring gear. And that's really what the two are, how the two work together and what the design's meant to do is that initial impact absorbed by the shock wheel and that smooths out your landing touchdown and then as you roll out those higher frequency uh, bumps that you're hitting are going to be absorbed up by the Grove gear. So on the previous landings, I was trying to land hard. This is a normal landing, fairly smooth, and you can see how the gear performs under those conditions. Really no bounce.
All right, guys, welcome back to the Project Kit Fox Garage. Kind of got a little workbench set up here. I thought this would be a good place to uh, film a little wrap up here of the shock wheel uh, testing and the shock wheel experience. Um, it's been a really fun project. Um, thank you guys for watching the video and uh, being patient on the video coming out. You know, I started dropping hints on this back in December when I installed it. So it's been a couple of months that I've had a chance to play around with it. And I did have to go through some learning curve with it that luckily I get to do and can pass on so you guys don't have to do it. Um, so let me talk real quick about those hurdles. And you can see from the video as it progressed through those video clips, the initial landings, the shock, shock wasn't doing much. And that was totally because of the way I set it up. Um, I thought that I needed more pressure in the shock than I really did. And that was because when it was sitting on the ground, I wanted that full three and a half inches of travel showing. So I had a nice deck angle so I could get a good departure angle on takeoff and also keep my prop clearance that I wanted because it does sit just a little bit lower when those are fully extended than in the uh, shock monster landing gear does. So I initially put, you know, they recommended putting in 85 PSI to start. I put in 120 because that's what I needed so that it didn't sag down on those shocks. And that was really my, my error. So <clears throat> I started out with that and the result was the shock wouldn't move much. And the Grove gear was doing, the spring gear was doing all the work. I wasn't getting any dampening and I was kind of puzzled on it. So I started lowering the PSI and I kind of saw the same results until I got down to the recommended 85, which is where I probably should have started. But as I moved down to 85, the sag on it got down to the point where they almost sit fully compressed on the ground. And I wasn't just wasn't sure if that was right, because some of the literature on it said you want about an inch and a half at least in the sag. And it kind of varies depending on how you park the plane. Um, if you come in in a turn or if you've, if you've done a hard landing and they're compressed, they'll tend to stay a little more compressed when you park it, where if you do a nice soft landing and you don't use that compression very much, then a lot more shock showing. So it's not very consistent on how it sits. Um, and as you park it and leave it in the air, in the hangar, they come back up slowly. So um, that's why I kind of struggle with the PSI rating. But once I got it down to 85 and started to see that shock articulate, especially on the initial impact and the bigger bumps, um, I really started to see the advantage of having the shock wheel. Now, I did send off an email um, to the engineers at Behringer about this issue. And Jan, uh, one of the engineers at Behringer, wrote me back and he said, um, the shock wheel inflation pressure needs to be quite low and it is normal to have them quite compressed when static on the ground. So that's, it's good to confirm that that's the situation. Because the high frequencies are taken by the gear leg, meaning the small bumps that are come at you quicker. Um, and when the big, impacts are, the big impacts are taken up by the shock wheel. And so you see that in the video when you take that initial hit, get the compression of the shock, and then it goes and translates from that compression, starts bending the Grove spring gear. Then when it springs back and you wanna go airborne, then the shock extends and keeps that tire on the ground and then you start seeing it articulate a little bit. Now you will notice that I did bounce, one, usually one initial bounce on most of my landings. Now, I was trying to land that thing pretty solid. Like I would come in and try to drop it from about two feet. So I was trying to get it to do that and not trying to get it to bounce, but see if it would. And if I had done that without the shock wheel, I would have been bouncing like this all the way, you know, probably twice the distance of the rollout because I wouldn't have any braking action. So yes, they do bounce when you land that hard. Um, but the shock monster landing gear, if you land hard enough, will bounce also. So, you know, I'm not going to give it a rating based off that one bounce because it comes right back to the ground and then the, the tire stays on the ground, whether it's getting light or not, but it's on the ground and it allows you to do the braking. So once they were set up proper, properly, I really found that they were doing exactly what I was hoping they would do. And that's take up that initial impact and the bigger impacts, dampen that shock or that impact. So you're taking it and then releasing that energy back slowly instead of springing it back and throwing you in the air. Um, so, you know, overall, I think they did exactly what they're designed to do once I got them tuned in right. And so then moving on to the other issue that I have with them is they're not 
rated for the gross weight of the kit box. And that's really something I've been trying to get their engineering department to look at before we release this video because that might be a real deterrent for all you guys that aren't in the LSA um, uh, category with your kit fox. It is, these are rated for 1,430 pounds and the kit fox can go to 1,550. So you don't wanna give up 120 pounds of useful load just by changing something on your landing gear. So I sent an email to the uh, engineering department and they got back to me with, instead of trying to push the rating of that particular setup, they're gonna go ahead and design a whole new shock wheel set setup specifically for the Kit Fox and similar weighted aircraft that are gonna use the big tires. Because the other issue we're running into is if you imagine this is the shock and then the axle comes out, we had to put a big spacer in there to move the axle out further in order to get the tire far enough out that it didn't hit the shock. And that was what the initial weight was on the whole setup was getting that spacer. Well, when you do that, you add a lever arm this direction. So you're, you're pulling up on that axle, which causes some force on the shock itself. Instead of sliding straight up and down, you're now trying to get it to bind on the inside of that shaft. What you're gonna get either way a little bit, but by moving it out, I think we did almost a two inch spacer. By moving it out that far, we may see that uh, situation exacerbated. And so um, what they decided to do instead is to take the shock and tilt it a little bit like this, which gives you the clearance from the tire. And then we can move the tire or the whole uh, wheel in closer and try to eliminate some of that lever arm and get a better uh, moving action there. The other thing you'll see is when you take off that the landing gear hangs, you know, like on a 180, uh, the Grove gear hangs a little low. So when you land, you're moving the wheel out like this. So if you have that shock uh, angled a little bit, by the time you get the weight on it, it's gonna articulate in a direction that will be beneficial. Um, so what to expect going forward is, I don't know the time frame on this redesign. Um, I sent an email back saying, you know, my, my thoughts on what they're proposing. Um, for those of you that are in the LSA, um, you know, whether with a turnkey LSA from Kit Fox, or you license your plane, or you utilize it under the LSA um, minimums with 1,320 pounds, the current setup I have on mine will work fantastic for you. So you can go ahead and move forward with a shock wheel system if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, if you wanna maintain your 1,550 pound gross weight, then this new design that will come out um, hopefully soon will be a more suitable um, setup for you. Um, the cost on it, um, they're still hammering out the final numbers on it, but it is not a cheap setup. Um, it's about equivalent to buying a whole shock monster setup, gear legs uh, and the suspension. Um, they use Behringer wheels and brakes, so if you already have them, that's a great benefit for you. If you don't, um, you should have them on your plane anyways, so that is going to be the same cost for either landing gear. Um, you're just adding the shock wheel. So it, 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 it'll be right around the same price as doing a whole shock wheel landing gear system. So uh, if you're thinking about it, you can look at, at that. And if you guys want an estimate, I can uh, set you up with, with the cost of whatever you need as far as just the shock wheel or the whole wheel and brake setup. Um, now, why would you do this over the shock wheel or over the shock monster? Well, <clears throat> If you were planning on going with a Grove landing gear, then this is the perfect setup for you. Um, because the Grove landing gear offers you a lower drag profile with a faster cruise, and it makes a really fun airplane to fly. By adding these on, the only drawback, only drawback I see is the uh, weight that you're adding. And it works out to, it was only 12 pounds, 11.2 pounds more than the TK1 landing gear. But it was, I think, um, I want to say 15.4 pounds total weight of the shock wheel um, system. So if you just had the straight up Grove landing gear system and you added the shock wheel, you're adding 15.4 pounds. That's the only negative. That's it. So other than that, you get the dampened suspension for off airport landings. You get the reduction in the drag or you, you retain that low drag profile, gives you better cruise. Now cruise speeds, I'm going to say based on my testing, was about eight to 10 miles per hour difference between 
um, the shock wheel with the Grove landing gear versus the TK1 landing gear, um, or the shock monster landing gear. So, you, you know, eight to 10 miles per hour is pretty significant if you're gonna, you know, be doing more than just local area flying. Um, where I found it to be the most beneficial was I could still pull back to that same speed that I was really pushing to get to with the, with the shock monster landing gear on it. I could pull back to that speed by using a lower engine setting, lower fuel burn, and it just flew so much better without all that drag, saved a gallon per hour and ran the Yamaha engine a thousand RPM less to maintain the same cruise speed that I would a thousand RPM ahead and a gallon more per hour with the shock monster landing gear on it. So it just, it makes the plane really, really fun to fly. I think it's easier on it. You know, anything, anytime you're reducing drag, it's just, it, it's gonna be beneficial. Now, compared to the shock monster landing gear, the off airport capability had the shock monster not been invented and I'd never flown that before, I would be absolutely thrilled with this uh, shock wheel setup. I would think it was the coolest thing ever. Um, and it is, it is super cool because it, like for the things I just mentioned, but since I've flown the Shock Monster, I know that you can really, really slam that thing on and not hurt the airplane. And that is something that, you know, I obviously haven't really, really slammed it on with the shock wheel and the Grove gear. It can take a pretty decent hit, but I would still feel more comfortable uh, with the Shock Monster landing gear for really rough terrain and really pushing the, the you know, the capability of the plane. Um, for example, in our stole drag racing, when we cross the line, it's not whether you're about to land, you know, if you're, you're not going to squeeze it on. It's you cross the line, you drop the flaps and you plant the wheels as close to that line as you can. Sometimes you're a foot above the ground. Sometimes you're five feet above the ground and that shock monster landing gear doesn't care. It takes it either way. And it feels like you did a great landing every time. If we did that with the straight up Grove landing gear, we'd be bouncing and bending and it wouldn't be pretty. So um, there's definitely um, a safety factor for that really hardcore off airport stuff with the shock monster landing gear. Um, so it really comes down to what your mission is. If you want a uh, fly local or off airport specific STI plane, the shock monster landing gear is gonna be a better landing gear for your setup. If you want a great all around airplane that can do everything well, um, then the Grove landing gear with the shock wheel, I think is a fantastic option. Um, I don't see any advantage to just going with the Grove landing gear after flying this, other than it saves, you know, other than the expense of it. Um, so uh, that's pretty much where I, I land on this whole, this whole evaluation of the shock wheel. Um, initially I was a little disappointed because it wasn't doing what I wanted it to. And that was totally because I didn't have it set up right. So now that I've got it, with the right PSI and it's starting to articulate the way I want. Um, I'm really having fun with it. And so if you guys are interested and want to check into it, you know, you always hit me up at bow and arrow at yahoo.com or I'm sorry, bow and arrow at yahoo is my email address and you can check out bow and arrow llc.com uh, for the website. Thanks for watching guys. Thanks for being patient on this video. I know it's been a long time in the making. And a lot of you guys are real curious about this setup. And I have to say, it's pretty cool. And it's been kind of neat to be the only one that has it and have the opportunity to test it for Behringer on the Kit Fox. And I want to thank them for giving me that opportunity to really play with, you know, cutting edge new stuff. I mean, it's been really fun to try something out, try something out that hasn't really been done before. And, uh, you know, it goes right along the the theme of this whole channel and this whole project, you know, with the Yamaha and everything is, is we're, we're trying new stuff and, and uh, hopefully it pushes um, aviation in a good direction. And um, I, you know, I've been real, real excited to be involved in it. So um, my overall rating is I love it. Um, I'll probably keep them on for quite a while. Um, I do have uh, the uh, Intention to put the other gear back on to test the large wing with the slats um, Just because the profile and the prop clearance and everything is more suited for the other gear um, And there'll be more on that. We're getting to a point where we're starting to think about trying out that wing um, 
we're looking at time frame and, and what kind of events are coming up and whether the airplane will be suited for that those events with that wing on it. Uh, so that's enough. I've talked long enough. Thanks for watching the video. Hit the subscribe button if you like it and uh, hit the notification bell for the next time I post a video and it may be a month. You never know. All right, guys, take care.